Arkminos. There we go. Let me continue with this. Okay. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening to me, inviting me to this uh, seminar. It's of course a pleasure to, to talk here. And uh, yeah, so welcome also to, to this uh, particular topic. Uh, that, I, that we will talk about today. This is uh, a bit of uh, discrete geometry, a little bit of uh, also some alg algorithmic questions that I will talk about. Uh, I, I guess it goes without saying as it's a seminar, but please interrupt me uh, any way you like. Or actually, I will not look at the chat. So if someone sees something on the chat, please also say uh, by voice. I, I can keep an eye on chat if you want. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so uh, I will talk about Bichromatic non-crossing matching. Before I forget, this is joint work with Marco Savic, who uh, my, actually used to be my student. Now he's a, a professor at my department. Anyway, uh, let's try to. Yeah, uh, I will. I will say uh, things uh, like introduce things step by step, and I don't need any any particular no, uh, to be an expert in in anything actually uh, to follow this. Hopefully, and then yeah. Uh, if, if there is something uh, that you don't understand, please, as I said, interrupt me. Anyway, geometric, uh, geometric perfect matchings, what do we mean? We, I mean, perfect matchings are generally you know, uh, things or, or objects in, in graph theory. So what are we going to match? Uh, we, can, we, we, we could match, of course, in geometric setting, various things, uh, points or anything else, basically. And uh, uh, Continuing with the general uh, overview, if we, we are deciding to match something, we can do it in so-called monochromatic way or bichromatic way, or sometimes it's referred to as red-blue. That means, uh, so the red-blue means that you have red objects and blue objects and you want to match red with blue. So you have two spe special kinds of uh, two special classes and then you want to just match one with the other or monochromatic, all objects are equal and then you just match uh, pairs. Uh, then, Looking at the connections that you use to, to match the objects or edges, if you wish, in, in, in graph theoretic setting, then uh, that, that could be curves or straight line, seg line segments or various planar objects other than that. Uh, and then uh, if you look at these connections, you may allow or not allow crossings. And uh, finally, uh, looking at the configuration that, you, uh, that your points are or uh, objects are arranged in, could be some general position, it could be 2D, 3D, some special special uh, configurations, et cetera, et cetera. And just uh, now that I gave a relatively uh, general overview, let, let us see what we are looking at today. That would be as depicted here on this slide, matchings of points, you have bichromatic uh, uh, setting, that means we have red and blue points. And as you see in the picture, we want to match red with blue. So one red with one blue, exactly in each, each matched pair. And we want to use straight segments to match them. We don't want the segments to cross. So crossings are not allowed. And finally, uh, uh, again, as you see in the picture, we will devote particular attention to the convex case. So the uh, points in convex position. All right. Uh, Talk, say a few words more about this uh, setup more formally. I mean, probably you just got it from the last slide anyway, but so R and B are two sets and red points and then blue points and R is the red and red points, B is the blue and blue points. And then we are interested in perfect matchings of points in R two points in B using non-crossing straight line segments. And that's that's a long structure, but basically not so, not so complicated with lots of words. So we will use the, use this abbreviation NCM, non-crossing matching, for, for sure, to say all this, perfect matchings of blah, blah, blah. So it's basically, we're skipping some words in the abbreviation, but it's all, we are always talking about perfect matchings and always red to blue, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, where do these appear? I mean, probably you can think of, of many, many various applications yourself. These red, blue matchings, this is basically pairing up, as I said, members of one group with the members of the other. And then you, you have this so-called supply and demand family of problems basically transfers to this to this setting, matching face shoppers with shops or antennas with the receivers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, 
just to mention a few few results dealing with this, starting with these papers that you see. Uh, these results uh, they they looked at the algorithms for finding uh, non-crossing uh, matchings between red points and various blue objects, or did these these and then many follow-up papers that that, that uh, dealt with this. So various blue matching red points and various blue objects with, where blue objects are something restricted or more or less restricted. And one one case that I looked at also was points, and then um, also some other things. Uh, in these in these uh, again results that you see here, uh, they studied uh, structural structural properties of the set of all possible non-crossing matching. So you look at the particular you fix your point set. And then uh, look at all possible non-crossing matchings, and then see how this how this uh, set sort of behaves. How to get one matching from the other? Say how uh, by flips or by some some other uh, so-called flip distance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera again, so various things you can you can uh, study here. Uh, what are we going to talk about? So the rest of my talk uh, is outlined here. We will take a closer look at the non-crossing matchings of bichromatic points as this is exactly what I defined in the, the beginning. And then we will look at some general or structural properties of the set of all, all those on a given bichromatic point set in convex position. And uh, we will see what kind what what is that what is it that we can say about this structure. And then uh, we will look at two applications. Uh, finding a bottleneck non-crossing matching of a particular uh, or, or a point, point set of a, a such point set, bichromatic convex point sets in, in, in n square time or quadratic time. Uh, so how to do it faster than, than, uh, than uh, so yeah, it was previously known. And also the same thing that if the points are on a circle, again, we can do it uh, fast fast lin lin linear time apparently and I will, I will mention some open problems and further res research directions okay so let's start uh, so this is a, a dichromatic point set in convex position and then if you look at these uh, matchings there are various ways you can match the points without crossings by straight line segments like this one and this one and this one and also this one and of course there are many others uh, uh, this is not uh, true for every point set that there are many others i mean first of all note that uh, the, the the arrangements of the points around the circle around the convex hull actually is what 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 determines if if uh, matching is valid or not and uh, this is probably clear already but let me point out that if 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 you look at if you look at uh, say uh, these two points here blue and these two points red so they you cannot cross you cannot match them the other way as as they would cross and that does not depend on particular geometric pos position of the of the points but only on the on the fact that this this one this blue one uh, comes before this one in the clockwise direction and i mean and the same for the, for the red if you look at them around the circle but yeah, so so looking at this arrangement around around the convex hull, we have we have in this particular point set only one unique non-crossing matching. So this is the only this what you see on the screen is the only way. And quite obvious that this is this is uh, or to, to to convince yourself oneself that this is the case. On the other hand, if you look at this point set where where the points alternate in colors around the convex hull, we have. Uh, every two points of different color can be matched in a valid non-crossing matching. So you have full liberty to to match points as far as I mean, as long as they are matched red to blue, of course, which is uh, obligatory. So there are different different situations, and uh, one thing that we will use uh, is the term feasible. So if you just have a pair of points I and J, this pair is feasible if there exists a non-crossing matching with, with, this, with this pair matched. So th this means that I can be matched to J, the point I can be matched to point J. And then uh, one thing that we can, we can prove, and this is what gives us, the, or what we rely on for structure, and this is what we will talk about later, is what we call orbits. Orbits are depicted here in the picture as this, this uh, gray uh, 
again, uh, calm exclosures of, of point set, but basically it's just a partition. This is to, just to uh, illustrate or the, to, to show us what the, pick, the, the, the partition of the point set is. So this, par this particular point set partitions into three sets. And these, these, are, these are again, what we call orbits. An orbit is a collection of points which can be matched to each other. It turns out that actually for every point set, the, the, the point set um, partitions into, into orbits in such a way that two points can be matched if they are, uh, so they are, in other words, they are feasible if they have different color and they belong to the same orbit. So for example, if you look at this particular point, this one is red, you know that because you know that this belongs to, if, if you trust me, this is the orbit, that actually it is. Uh, if this one, this one, this red can be matched, say to this one, in a valid matching, but it cannot be matched, for example, to this one. This is not this one. Is, this one would work, and this one would work. Actually, if you would match this one, it's obvious that you you cut off this one red point here, which is not fixable, so you cannot match everything. It wouldn't be a perfect matching. So it's clear this one is not uh, matchable with this, but the, the, the interesting thing about these orbits is that, that they are really a partitions, meaning that every two points of different color uh, get their feasibility strictly if from the fact that they belong to or not belong to an orbit. May I ask oh, a question? Of course. So is it true that two points are feasible if everything to its left has the same number of red and blue? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, a, that's an if and only if, yeah. Exactly. So we have we have uh, basically this this property is is directly inherited from the, from the property that you just mentioned. Uh, as as Thorsten said, just just to make sure that we understand, if you if you connect these two on this side, you have the same number of red and blue points automatically also on the other side, and that that's that's the only way. No, no, sorry. The, the only reason you you are not allowed to match two points is that this is not this property is not satisfied. In which case, you obviously cannot match. Yeah. Hey, sorry, can you repeat the definition of an orbit? Or, or what so is or, or orbit? Orbit is, is defined here. Uh, this is the definition. Uh, orbit is a partition of the point set in such a way that two points are feasible if and only if they have different color and belong to the same orbit. And feasible means they, 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 there is a matching, valid matching with these two points match. What, what is an orbit? So there are two definitions here. Orbit is a partition. So this is, this was, so, I, okay. So I put the theorem before the, the actual definition. Uh, so if you wish, if you want, you could- I just, I just don't understand still what, so the definition of orbit is a partition, right? Orbit is, a, is such a partition that two points are feasible if and only if they have different color and belong to the same orbit. To, to show that this is a valid, that, 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 uh, that, that this is a valid definition, you need this theorem basically. But what is O of I? I don't understand this notation. This is, a, this is the, uh, the, the label of the orbit. The so orbits are the part. The orbits are the parts of the partition. Ah, yeah, okay. so this means uh, okay. I and J belong to the same orbit. And if I just may, uh, I, I guess this, from what you said, this partition is unique, right? Yes. Okay. Ah, so orbits with S is a partition and each set is called an orbit without an S? I don't understand. Each, so orbits are a partition of the point set. Uh, such that, so every point set partitions into sets, which we call orbits, uh -huh. such that two points can be matched if and only if they are in the same. I see. So, okay, so the same class in the partition, the same. Yes, set. exactly. So in this picture, if, I mean, picture pair may, may be helpful, really. Can you match two points? Well, yes, if they have different color and belong to the same gray uh, and gone, K gone in this picture or yeah, same, same part of the partition. Okay, any other questions?
So what was the observation of Torsen that that? Uh... So if you if you match two two points can be matched. They they are feasible. They can be. They are in the same orbit, if and only if they have different color. And when you connect them with a segment on the side of it, or, or both sides, the number of uh, red and blue is the the set is balanced. Number okay. of red and run, run, okay. number of blue is the. It's a ham sandwich. It's a ham sandwich cut. So yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, no, not the ham sandwich cut. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's the a, number of red is the same as the sorry, number of red yeah, on the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a balanced Harding, yeah. cut. A balanced cut. Yes, it's a balanced. Not. not yeah. Oh, it's, it's a ham sandwich cut. That's the two-dimensional. No, is it? Uh, it's same? not. It's not because a ham sandwich would be that the number of red on the left is the same as the number of red on the right. Right. Ah, so okay. We don't want that. We want the number of red okay. on the left to be the, the same as the number of blue on the left. Okay, not not yeah. exactly half. Okay, yeah, whatever. Okay. Are we good? Now it's good that we clear this out because this is really important for the rest of the talk. Okay, so uh, why don't we continue? Uh, yeah, one thing that we will need for later to co to compute these this this partition, we can do it in linear time. That's what uh, turns out, and then. How how do we how how can the set of orbits look like? Well, in this set where where everything can be matched to everything of different color, then we obviously have one orbit. So if the points alternate in colors. On the other hand, in this extreme example where all points of blue color are together on the convex hull, we have uh, orbits are actually pairs where there's these unique pairs unique unique uh, points where or pairs of points that can be uh, matched and then uh, you have the third example as, as an intermediate case or lots of examples where, where there are several orbits but uh, these two would be the, the extreme and then one uh, two more definitions that we need for later uh, this is something that we call so there are two terms like uh, or notions edges and diagonals what what do we mean by that two different kinds of segments if you have this matching this is a valid matching on this point set and if we look at the orbits, this particular point set has two orbits. Then we say the edges are the segments in this matching, which are connecting consecutive points in the orbit. So for example, this one here, or yeah, this one here connects two consecutive points of the, of the orbit, but also this one here, even though it goes across on the orbit, uh, boundary, it is the two consecutive points. So these are, this is what we call edges. And then the rest are the diagonals. These are the solid lines. I will remind you that th th these are the two notions, but we will use occasionally the term edge to denote consecutive points on the on the orbit boundary. So just- uh, so, yeah. oh, oh, you mean they are just edges of the convex hull of this- the Exactly, of the orbit. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't draw all the edges, right? Just some. I did not. I just drew. I looked at this particular matching. Oh, yeah, yeah. And just in, in among those segments, some of them will are, are edges happen to be edges like these, and some of them happen to be yeah. diagonals okay. like Thank these. You. Thank you. So, so in in every matching, is is it true that for every orbit we need at least two edges, assuming that the orbit is not just a single edge? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, true. Anyway, now let's uh, look at those orbits in more more uh, detail. So if we if we look at we will we will always look at this counterclockwise direction around the convex hull, and then there are two th two two ways that an edge of an orbit can uh, appear around looking in this direction. It can be either red blue or blue blue red. This is this first, this one here is a red is a red blue because in this direction we first get to the point red and then which is red and then the one that, which is blue. Okay, and the second one, the one here, bold edge here, this one is blue red because first we get to the blue point and then we get to the red point. So every every segment is either red blue or blue red, or every edge is a. a either red, blue, or blue, red. 
And this is also what we will distinguish. Uh, if we look at these orbits, so here, here is the is a point set, a point set with orbits. We denote them by A, B, and C. Notice the following. So this is first the first uh, bullet corresponds to this picture. All points of C are right of the red blue edges of A. So this is A. And if you look at the red blue edges, what are the red blue edges? Every other one, this one, this one, and this one. These are red blue, and the other three ones are the blue red. So if you look at the red blue and look at look to the right of them or out, if you wish, in this counterclockwise direction, all of the points of C lie in this in this uh, space. Okay. On the other hand, if you look at the second second bullet. This would be this picture here. All points of A, they, they lie right of the red, blue edges of blue, of, of B, sorry. This is B as here. So this is the same, the same structure here, it's just uh, exemplified and then for these two cases. So if you look at again the red, blue edges of, of B, these are these two, and all of A is to the right. Of these. And this is one property that we want to look at. It turns out that if you look at any two orbits in any point set, no points of B are right of the red blue edges of A if and only if all points of A are right of the red blue edges of B. In other words, one of these two has to happen. So, uh, because, like, Points have to be somewhere, right? They have to be outside of either red, blue, or blue, red. But it turns out that no points of B are right of the red, blue edges of A, if and only if all points of A are right of the red, blue. Of so we're always going to look at this right of the red, blue, and right of the red, blue is the same as we as we saw here, like the property that we saw in these two bullets. Okay, and having this in mind, we can define the order among the orbits. What, how do we define this uh, relation? A is less or equal than B, if and only if all points of A are right of the red, blue edges of B. So it's again, the same thing. We always have the same thing here, as here, as here, as in the previous slide. So we look at the right, the red blue edges of one orbit. If all, if all the points of the other orbit are on the right of them, then we have this, this relation. Okay, and so what do we know about this relation? It turns out this relation is a total, total order on orbits, total order. So in this particular example, we have this, or, this, uh, this relation of these three orbits, as we saw, in these previous in the previous slide, in these two bullets, we saw that this holds, and we saw that this holds in the other bullet. So we have this, and also you can check that also for C and C and B, the same holds, and one can prove that it's a total order actually. So what 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 can we conclude from this? Well, uh, if you think about it, how how do different different orbits interact? So we will we will. Uh, Okay, let me just say it here, sorry. Uh, two, two orbits, if two orbits are somehow disjoint, if these, these are the two orbits, then you can match anything you like here and anything you like here. And these two edges will not interact, meaning not uh, interfere, meaning not intersect. So this, this would be good. But if they cross, if this is one orbit and this is the other orbit, then certain edges are, a certain certain segments will interfere. For example, if you if you if you connect this one and this one, and you you cannot connect this one and this one, of course, this is a a problem because they intersect, right? And which would which which are going to intersect? This is directly determined by where are the points in terms of of, of this of this relation that I keep looking at, right of the red blue or either these points are right of the red blue of these or these are right of the red, red blue of the other ones. Okay, 
And then we define, actually, this is the last thing that we need in terms of definition, the so-called orbit graph. This is the gra directed graph with orbits as vertices. So the vertex set of this graph is set of all orbits. And two orbits have a directed edge or arc, if you wish, from, sorry, yeah, this should be B. From A, there's an arc from A to B, if and only if A is less or equal than B and A and B cross. So that means they do cross, so we, they, they could interfere. And actually we know that all points of A are, are to the right of the red blue of, of, of B. And then actually we know how, which, which connections will cross and which connections will not cross. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is what we can prove. Uh, orbit graph, this graph that we just defined has a segmented structure. And not only that, but it's actually a characterization of orbit graphs. This, this, this here, definition of a segmented structure of a graph gives us a total characterization of, of, of orbit graph, meaning that directed graph is, is the orbit graph of a, of a point set, if and only if it, it has a segmented structure. So also, if you have any graph, I will just get in the, in, into the description of what this means in a second, but actually it's a characterization. If you have a graph satisfying this set of conditions, then there is a point set for which it, it is an orbit graph. It, it is the orbit graph. So what is, what is this segmented structure? It's very simple. So you can order the vertices from V0, V1, et cetera, up to V, uh, whatever, M minus one, in such a way that if this is an arc, I'll put more vertices here. If this is an arc, then anything, so if, if this is an arc, so all arcs go upwards, first of all, and if this is an arc, then all included in it, in terms of interval are also, maybe can, I can do it with, a, with another color. If this red is, the, is an arc, then also this has to be an arc and this has to be an arc, et cetera, et cetera, everything included here. And then maybe if this is an arc, then also all these have to be there as well. So every, every graph that has this structure has a point set such that this is an, the orbit graph of, of, of that point set is exactly this graph. So this once more, what, what is this? Vertices are orbits and an arc is there if two orbits cross and so they, they cross and one is one, uh, one below is less or equal than the other in this order that we defined. Okay. Any questions at this point? So we can we can conclude lots of things from this, but I will just have I will just uh, say one, and as we will I will show you how to use this particular one. So each it turns out each weakly connected component of G contains a unique Hamiltonian path. So how to use this I will show you in a second. And uh, one more remark. The, this total order and the Hamiltonian paths of, of, of this that we just mentioned here, all the Hamiltonian paths can be computed in linear time. So once this, we get the, yes. this Hamiltonian path is just the one that follows the vertices in the, in the order. Or is yes, there exactly. So to... like if you would have this graph that I just had on the previous slide and you have certain uh, arcs, say like this, and also all arcs inside based on what I just said are there. Say you have three connected components, then there would be a Hamiltonian path here following exactly as you said, just going through it. This the red is one, this one would be the other one and this one here would be the third one. Yeah, like that. And this is, and it's like a weak, weakly connected, meaning that there are, there are no arcs going around uh, between those components, right? 
Yes. And now I will show you how to how to use this uh, one application. So what is the bottleneck matching? So this is now we're looking at these matchings that we're talking about in this in this talk, and we want to minimize the length of the longest segment. So of all point sets, so if we have this point set, there are various matchings. And if you look at each of them, you look at what is the longest segment. Yeah. So this one, obviously, this is the longest one, and so on and so on. And then it turns out this is the this is the bottleneck non-crossing matching, meaning that it has the shortest longest segment. So you, you look at the longest segment in each of those, and then you find you minimize this. You take the one which has the long the, the, this this longest segment as short as possible. Is this clear? Or is are there any questions? Okay, so this is what we are looking for, and let's see how to. Yeah, this is unique. Sorry, this is unique. This place. Uh, not necessarily. If if you look at it, for example, if you would have this, say this uh, longest segment being this one, if you would reshuffle uh, possibly some orbit. Imagine you're having a really small orbit or really packed points around here. Say, imagine there is one very small orbit here you can you can match these any way you like of course right like these uh, 100 points that i put here right this would still be the 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 shortest the the, the shortest longest segment or whatever the longest segment that, that uh, gives us the actual value of this button but note note one thing uh, that you asked so uh First of all, there could be more than one. And also now geometry does matter of the points. It's not that the order matters only, but we really uh, position, exact positions of the points matter as well for this particular optimization problem. So we are searching, we want, we want to find this as, as fast as possible, a bottleneck matching as, as, as Thorsten observed that there could be more. So we want one, compute it fast. And just uh, quick to say a few results about this. Uh, already some time ago, it was shown that in general position, it's MP hard to to to, uh, uh, to, 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 to find it. Uh, and then, uh, so yeah, general position is all, always much, much different when, when it comes to these non-crossing matchings and, and uh, special cases like, like convex, convex, half, convex uh, position. Uh, in this paper, they showed how to do it in cubic time and for points in a circle, they showed how to do it in n log n time. And uh, we are going to show now how to do it in quadratic time for convex position and, and linear time in, in, on a circle. And, and actually, what I want to start with, and which is not not too hard or completely, I can give you the whole, most of the, or everything, uh, all the main, main parts of the proof is points on a circle. So what do we have? We have this theorem actually, if you have points, not only in convex position, but on a circle, like in this picture, then already in this paper, it was shown that for, for those points, so such points, sets, there is a bottleneck matching pairing each point with the first feasible point, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Meaning you, always, you use only edges. I should have, yeah, okay, I have that. Using edges only. This is what we just defined some, yeah, some minutes ago, that there are edges and diagonals you can always find the bottleneck matching pair using only edges. What is, so this, just to remind you, probably you remember, this is an edge because it's two consecutive points on the same orbit. So basically, if you look at one orbit, there are two options. Either match, take red blue edges or take blue red edges. So you have two op op options, of course, still the space of these can still be exponential because there could be many orbits and you have two choices for each. So it could be two to the number of orbits options to choose from, but it's much more restricted than in the general case. And we can use this. How can we use this? So this is what I just said. So they're just given an orbit. There are just two options, either this or this. And then if so why, why, how can we use our, our orbit graph? This is our orbit graph, the one that I was drawing with those 
etc. Arcs. If we have A and B with an arc, this is A and this is B, and there is an arc, then we know that we cannot choose blue red edges of A and red blue edges from B. Because automatically by having this arc, we know that they cross first of all, and moreover, because of the way, of the way how we define this order, that A is less or equal than B, we know that the blue red edges of A and red blue edges from B will cross. So if you have these two, two orbits crossing like this, obviously you have sort of, okay, so in this particular case, at least, if you have four points on each of them, you just have one of the two of the one intersecting one of the two of the two. And this is exactly the red blue in the second one and the blue red of the first one, it turns out, always. So we really know for each of these options, for each of the orbits, which will cross which, based looking at this graph here. And this is a really powerful tool, it turns out as, if you look at the orbit graph, and knowing that we have these Hamiltonian path, path that I just uh, was drawing again, and we, that we showed it always exists and can be computed efficiently or in linear time, we know that the only option that we can have looking at one particular Hamiltonian path is this, that we have in one orbit, in the first orbit of the Hamiltonian path, we have red blue edges chosen, then we have again red blue edges and so on. But once we switch from red blue to blue red, this is the sort of the, the important part, or I, let me not draw too many things. Once we switch here from red blue to blue red, there is no, no turning back because you cannot have these crosses. You cannot have, uh, if you would have after blue red, again, red blue, you would viol violate this theorem or yeah, this theorem doesn't allow it. So basically, if you look at this, the only, instead of having exponentially many options where for each orbit, you can choose red, blue or blue, red, you just have linearly many options. You just need to choose where to switch from red, blue to blue, red. As this theorem guarantees that the only way to do it is to just switch once and never, never switch back. Okay, so the space switches to, or, for, or uh, changes from, from exponential to linear. And then we, of course we can do it in linear time. So we can, as I said, compute Hamiltonian paths and the whole graph in linear time and, and then traverse and explore all the options for each Hamiltonian path in linear time. And obviously if uh, looking at different weak components of this graph that I kept drawing on this left side, so I will still do it. If you would have components which have no arcs between them, Obviously, they they completely they are completely disjoint from each other. So, obviously, you can do whatever you do here above the line is completely independent from what you do below. So, obviously, each each of the component can be done separately and independently. And then you just explore all these options, and you you get the linear time altogether. And just a few remarks. Uh, so, by the way, the time wise. How, how are we? Uh, are we, we, are, we are still fine. We're good. So, yeah, yeah I, I'll, good. I'll be done soon. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, so, if you look at the general case, this is, uh, this is more, more, more things that I, 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 I cannot really, I mean, they're compl sort of yeah, long. And we need also to look at the geometry and et cetera, et cetera. But I will just show you some, some things that, I, uh, that are actually the main. The main ideas of how to do it in general case. I mean, when I say general, I mean not circle, but convex bichromatic points. So, in full generality of the of the realm of the or what of the space of metrics that we are looking at in this talk. So we we have what we call cascades. What is that? You just look at diagonals. So just diagonals. This would be not edges, but the diagonals. So this would be the solid lines here. So if you look at these two, this is one cascade. Then these two, he, these three here are another cascade. And these two here are the third cascade. So this is three cascades that we have. What is that? That's basically diagonals that are parallel to each other. Meaning there's, there's no other diagonal 
completely on one side of the, of the convex hull between. So if you would have a diagonal here, this would not be the same cascade anymore, right? So in that sense, parallel to each other. So no other diagonals in between. There could be edges in between, but we don't look at the edges. We just look at the diagonals. And for some reason, actually, this is, this is important. Actually, why is it important? I can say right away. So yeah, so this is the, the nicer picture. We have three cascades here in this particular matching. And then we can prove that there is a bottleneck matching with at most three cascades. So it's enough to look to find one. It is enough to look at three cascades at most. And then actually you can, you can look at this problem as, as, as uh, by looking at sub problems. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you, if you would subdivide this into sort of three parts, say this, this way and this way and this way, then you just, in each of these sub problems, like this one here, or like, yeah, it's clear. There are three of them between the, those separating lines. Each of them just has one cascade. In, in this in this part in this part here. Okay. And then these are our sub problems. So optimal single cascade matchings in a, in, a, in, a, in a subset of consecutive points. So this is an interval looking at the convex hull, uh, consecutive points on the convex hull. So that, that's our sub problems. And obviously if you want, if you know that sub, subdivision into cascades is like this three, like this, then you want to optimize here and you want to optimize here and you want to optimize here, of course, independently. The shortest you can get here and the shortest you can get here, the shortest you can get here, the better of the longest segment. And then knowing this, so of course, each of these sub problems should be solved as fast as possible. We can solve them in quadratic time, each of each particular one of them. Oh, I mean, not each particular, all of them, sorry. But so, we still need to combine them. How to combine them once we have the solutions? If we have at most one cascade, that's actually, if you look at the points around the convex hull, if there is at most, if there is exactly one cascade, that's actually a sub problem, just having everything in one sub problem. So that's, that's actually what we get for free every solution, every, every case of having at most one cascade. If you have two cascades, to think about it, it's not possible. It's not possible to have some diagonals parallel like this and then some other parallel like this. If you want them not to be in the same cascade, not to be case one, then you need some third cascade to, to, have, to have a separation of the first two. So that's actually not possible. And then the, 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 the case of three cascades remains. And then if we just split in three parts and use sub problems in all possible ways to split into three, this is cubic in all possible ways to, to just go through all possible splits like this. So this would be cubic time. This is not an improvement to, to the previously best, no? But what we can do is that now using the orbits, we can show that it is enough to consider only certain splits. So not all, cubically many splits, but actually just quadratically many splits. And uh, then we have quadratic time altogether because for some problems we need quadratic times so altogether. Sorry, I might, get, I might have missed that. something. Do you not have to call this quadratic algorithm now n square times for all different? Uh, which, which one? So this, this one? So, so you, you have n squared different partitions into cascades that you need to Consider. Yes, but uh, sub -problem, each subproblem can be should be uh, solved only once. So what we do, we, we pre-process. Oh, by all, all subproblems, you mean all subproblems? Sub oh, okay. yeah. Sorry, okay. I actually okay. I, I actually yes. said it wrong wrong yeah. way, but so I corrected myself. So just to just go back, sorry. All subproblems can all together all subproblems like over over all possible. Yes. That's okay. okay. Not not just each subproblem yeah. can be solved in quadratic time. Okay. All. Okay. All sub problems can be solved in quadratic time. Yeah. So we we get we solve all the sub problems. We we finish. We store this, and then we go through all possible. As we find all actually, we need to find all n squared splits that are interesting, three way splits. Like splits, splits are still splits into three parts. 
and then we just read from our from our uh, like sort of this dynamic uh, the, the table of sub problems what is the what is the longest segment for each of these three and then we have the total solution and it's all together a quadratic time in uh, algorithm okay just uh, I will, I will uh, if yeah so I will get to some some op open problems there are lots of open problems here uh, of course, this there is a super, a, a, a comp, a very com, complex open problem. What if points are not in convex position? Yeah, that's a very general question. We know now what to do, or we sort of have a very nice structure that we can work with if we have convex position. But if we if we say put one vertex inside the convex hull, it's already much less clear what to do and how to transfer this. And not to mention general position or the position in full generality without any, any, any assumptions. This, of course, there are many other results already uh, known about this that, that give us a hint that this is uh, substantially different, but actually it, it would be nice to know this answer or a partial answer or some, some kind of uh, structure, uh, structural result for any position other than convex. Actually, I would be very interested to see that. And, uh, Something or how does this relate what we what we have for 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 these these uh, general whatever general means more general than convex positions including just a couple of points out uh, not on the convex hull or say one there is one uh, there are several special cases also uh, special cases done apart from convex position for example there is this there are several that are this this I'll just mention this one if you have blue points on a line. So if you have blue points are all on one line and red points are in this half uh, half plane, say above like this, anywhere in the half plane. Then uh, they show in this paper that uh, they can do it or they can find that the bottleneck matching in cubic time. And they also, they can tell a lot about the structure. Apparently you can, look at certain points let's say the highest point of red and if you look at its connection its connection splits everything into two parts and so on then you can exploit this but they have a clever approach to, to actually tackle this but already if you have if you allow points on the other side as well the red ones it gets much more complicated and uh, that's open for example also uh all blue points in a circle and red points say inside or outside and you name it there there are several special cases that are interesting for various reasons that are that are more or less open so if you would have so again imagine that blue points are on the on the on the on the circle and red are all inside or outside or something like that so that's that's for example open and there are yeah i will i will uh, i i i don't want to say more uh yeah so i'll 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 stop here actually yeah thank you all right, thank you very much, Milos. Um, do we have questions? Yes, for instance, what about other than Euclidean distances in the plane, let's say? Uh, you mean uh, for, for bottleneck, of course. Yeah, so that's uh, that's an interesting question. So our, uh, our approach certainly doesn't uh, automatically transfer to, an, to another metric. Uh, we, we use the you really use some Euclidean properties, say angles of triangles, uh, implying the uh, lengths of sides of triangles, et cetera, et cetera. And also for the circle case, you know know a lot about the Euclidean distance in the, on, in the circle. And this of course breaks down if you go to another uh, metric. So it would be an interesting, it's, an, it's, it's also a, not, has not been studied. And I think it's an interesting question. And I don't know much about what what would be the complexity. So, are these chromatic uh, sort of matchings also studied in higher dimensions? Like, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, there, there, there are. Of course, you have to say. Of course, yeah, the situation changes. So, if you have uh, matching by segment, then uh, you don't have this non-crossing, or at least not with the same flavor as in, in two dimensions. 
uh, then you can, uh, depending on what you, how you change the, uh, how you, how exactly you transfer to 3D or high D, high dimension or D dimensional space, it may be somehow differently defined. But actually, non-crossing with high dimensions is not, there's not really a, a such nice, unique uh, way of defining it. Of course, with matchings that, that for for an obvious reason that these segments would generally not typically not cross. Uh, but yeah, so. If you if you decide to match triples and then you look at these these uh, sim simplest or like triangles clo uh, convex closures of the three triples which are triangles and then you may look at that but that gets increasingly complicated so and also less it's less uh, transfer it transfers less to to some some uh, real life problems actually so make one may wonder what what exactly how exactly you want to define it. So if I'm interested in counting the number of red-blue matchings crossing free, and assume you just give me the uh, graph, the orbit graph that you defined, and for each orbit, the number of points in it. How much can you say from this about the number of matchings? Yeah, so uh, if you look at, of course, if you look at each particular orbit, then the orbit is actually completely the same as this uh, alternate, I mean, in the orbit, in one orbit, points need to be alternating. This is what we already concluded. So, in, in, in a given orbit, of course, we know what the number of uh, matchings would be. So, if uh, we have a single orbit, then it's the Catalan number, I guess, right? Yeah, it would, it would be, it would be, uh, if they would be monochromatic, but then you have to exclude some. So, there is, of course, yeah. So, but again, it's a, it's a Catalan, it's a different mm -hmm. number. So, right. So, there is, there are two, two, two possibilities. Either you have, if you have monochromatic, so you can match any two points, then it would be this fame, this sort of uh, situation with the Catalan numbers. If you have more bichromatic, you can still count them and you actually, again, Catalan numbers get into picture. So, yes, it is, it is Catalan numbers of some kind. And, uh, the, the, of course, the, the thing that gets complicated is, uh, which exactly, which matchings exactly cross mm -hmm. uh, with the other orbits matchings, and with that, uh, if we look, if you're looking at bottleneck, what we looked at, then you have certain restriction of what you of the space, as as I mentioned, that you only need at most three cascades, etc., etc., etc. But if you're counting, then of course you cannot do that, mm -hmm. and then uh, at this point we don't have enough to actually get a really good pin on the on the down on the, on, the, on, the, on the number. Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes. So Milos, at the beginning, you I think that you mentioned some things that are known to be MP hard or MP complete. What were those? Uh, yeah. So in the yeah, there was. Oh God knows where was this? No, yeah, it was. Uh, no, yeah, sorry, not not here, but the no, it, it was the bottleneck. Try finding the mod bottleneck. Uh, I don't know where it is. Finding the bottleneck matching of a, a bichromatic point set in general position. This is mm -hmm. MP hard. Yeah, here. And oh, yeah. So it's not known to be an NP. Uh. Well, uh, like it could be sigma too hard or something as well. Right. Right. It's not known to be MP in NP, right? Yes. But that's another interesting open. Point. Yes, that's a, that's an interesting. Yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I haven't thought about it much, but yeah, you're. It seems, yeah, it seems that. Yeah, this, this is true. Yeah, it's it, no, it's yeah. You, you're right. Yeah. It, it's it's an interesting problem and it's not not known. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions? That doesn't seem to be the case. There's also nothing in chat. So, yes. Thank you very much again, Milos, for the nice talk.